Okay, all, so here's how today's gonna go. We're gonna do a recap and a Q&A. So I'm just trying to move slow at the start of these classes now that we're gonna kind of getting into the core of the material of the course. Then I'm gonna give us a definition of a mean, M-E-A-N. So this is another expectation, but like probability, it depends on a particular function that you're taking the expectation of. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Two examples and then a practice problem. Now, to be honest, the last section at 10 o'clock this morning could not answer one of my math questions in the second example. And so I gave them a challenge problem based on that. Uh, it's kind of mean, <laughs> but I thought it was appropriate because nobody was saying anything. So if you all don't answer my question in the second example correctly, I'm going to give you the same challenge problem. Then I'll give you a practice problem, which I had planned. I had not planned on the first challenge problem for this section earlier today. Uh, and then I got two more examples. So maybe that should say two more examples. And then I got a challenge problem at the end. Um, so at this point, I'm trying to give you lots, lots of problems to work on. Uh, you can develop them and put them in your course notes or not, whatever helps you personally most. Um, okay, so let's just jump in. And hopefully you all will ask questions as we go. Okay, so we're gonna do a recap and Q&A, so questions and answers. We're gonna start with discrete distributions. And we'll do a second slide of recap just for continuous distributions. So at this point in the semester, we have been looking at, looked at expectations. And that's this crazy idea in the world of statistics that you can operate on functions. So we have defined the expectation to be an operation named capital bold E, and it is a function, it is an operation that takes other functions. And through different choice, choices of G, we have started to define named expectations, like different types of expectations. So in general, expectations for discrete distributions are, you all tell me, sums or integrals for discrete distributions? Sums. Nice, sounded like Jacob, thank you. That's a sum across all the values x in the sample space. And you take that function, which is the argument, and you multiply it by some density function. And you add up the product of those. So we have two basic pieces here. We've got a density function, which at this point I've left unspecified. And we have some other arbitrary function, g. And I've also left that unspecified at this point, which is probably what makes this so confusing. But let's remind you that we have used this framework to define probability as a function. Specifically for probability, we choose that function g to be an indicator function. So if you take an expectation of specifically an indicator function, you will get out probability. So the way we are to think of this is probability is taken on sets. And you can get that calculation by taking the expectation of an indicator function. The indicator function is just the function that takes on the one when its argument is in the set A and a zero otherwise. So the nice thing about that is it actually makes what's inside the sum relatively easy. It doesn't look relatively easy, but it really kind of is. Because an indicator function only takes on two values, ones and zeros. When 
the argument x is in the set A, then the indicator function is one. And one times the density function is just the density function. Now, when x is not in the set A, then the indicator function is just zero. And zero times whatever is just zero. So it's only when the indicator function is indicating that the argument is in the set A that we add up the density function. So on a plot, if we just had some made up discrete density function defined over the sample space one, two, three, and four, and we just kind of arbitrarily choose for example, A to be equal to the set consisting of two and three, then this entire summation is just saying, add up the area at two and the area under the density function at three, because only for the values of X in two and three, does this sum contribute any mass? Only at x equals to two is the indicator function one. So you'll just add f at two plus, and then only when x is equal to three is this thing gonna otherwise take on any value besides for zero. So only f at two plus f at three, f at two and f at three, are we gonna get any values out of this sum. So the piece we're highlighting here is we have this operation expectation, which kind of generalizes area under density functions, but it actually operates on some arbitrary function. And it's through this arbitrary function that we get to define probability specifically when that arbitrary function is an indicator function, then we get probability out. Okay, I'm gonna pause for like 20 seconds and make sure nobody has questions on the discrete version of this. And then I'm just gonna repeat the whole slide again for continuous distributions. Edward, when it was dealing with uh, industry, that's when you can't take a, a, an individual point because there's no area under one one spot, point. like two or three, one point. Correct. But it works for discrete because we are saying that there's area under the point two and three because it's just two and three. Correct. Since we're not dealing with an integral here, then you're not trying to integrate at a single point. It's only when you're dealing with that integral where the area under the function at any given point is equal to zero. Because if you remember, the integral is essentially defining um, boxes that shrink down to zero in the limit. And so as soon as that limit shrinks down to zero, there's no more area at a particular point for an integral. But it does work okay with sums. Right, so Josiah, what I think you're um, doing is like predicting what's coming up on the next slide and applying it to your understanding of this slide. So that's good. That says you're at least like thinking forward on the material we're looking at already. Yeah, cool. Yeah, great. Other questions before I move on and essentially just repeat this slide, but with integrals instead of sums. Okay, so we're doing a quick recap and hopefully more than just one question.
and I'll try to provide good answers. And this time we're gonna do continuous distributions. I'm breaking that up into two slides to emphasize the fact that as we are looking at expectations, which we denote with this capital bold letter E, that it's really just generalizing area under functions for discrete distributions, that is distributions defined on countable sets or continuous distributions, which are distributions defined on uncountable sets. So what we have is this function that we call expectation that generalizes area under functions. It acts on some arbitrary function G with respect to some density. So in this case, for a continuous distribution, that's a distribution defined on a uncountable set. What we do is multiply this function G by the density function and integrate with respect to whatever our variable is. So we've got two functions working for us. We've got a density function and some arbitrary function. And it's through this arbitrary function that we are defining different types of expectations. So probability has been our first type of expectation. Probability specifically shows up when this arbitrary function is an indicator function. Probability specifically shows up when this function that expectation is operating on is an indicator function. The way you might write it out for a continuous distribution is really just following the same pattern. Notice that the stuff inside the integral and the sum are identical. The stuff inside the integral and the sum are identical. The only thing that changes is like how you operate on this product. So in this case, it's an integral over all the values in the sample space of the indicator function. So I'm just filling in that specific value that is the argument to expectation times the density function. And the same logic applies. The indicator function is only one when the argument is contained in the set A. So if you had some arbitrary continuous distribution and you had some set A equal to an interval from little a to B, then you'd essentially just be finding the area under the density function within the set A. Because only within the set A is the indicator function one, and one times the density function is just the density function. Anytime the indicator function is zero, you'll have zero times the density function, which is just zero. And thus the integral won't contribute anything when the indicator function is zero. The integral will not contribute anything outside of A because the indicator function will be zero. And so everything inside the integral will be zero. So what these two slides are doing is kind of recapping everything we've seen in this semester, basically up to this point. We have two different distribution types that depend on the size of the sample space. Depending on the size of the sample space, this expectation operation kind of generalizes area under the function. So area under the function for continuous distributions is basically an integral. And to answer a question in the uh, chat, 
but I see that Brendan already did and Josiah already did. Thank you, thank you to you both. To generalize area under functions, expectation also works for discrete distributions by taking sums of the product of this arbitrary function g times some density function. So I'm going to pause for like a minute to give, you know, more shy people time to type out their questions in the chat or to gather their confidence. Edward, can you go back to continuous? Of course. So you're talking about the indicator function, that mm -hmm. one sub a of x. Mm -hmm. And right now it's it's given a value of one. And you said if it was given a value of zero, then there's just no area. But will mm -hmm. we see it be a different value than one? No, the indicator function only takes on those two values, one or zero. And so does that mean that the area between A and B is one? As in, like, it's it's kind of seen as a percentage in a way? It is seen as a percentage, but um, it doesn't have to be equal to one unless the set A is the entire sample space. So let me see if I can amend this picture a little bit using a third color. So in this case, S is equal to, the way I've drawn this, is essentially the set zero to positive infinity. And in that case, you're looking at area under the entire distribution, area under the entire density function. So one of the rules we have is that the probability of the entire sample space is one. Because A is a subset of the sample space, this area here is guaranteed to be less than one. And because it's not an empty set, it's basically also guaranteed to be bigger than zero. Awesome, okay. Yeah. So it is a percentage. I think what um, is frustrating you at this point, and maybe frustrating is too strong a word, but let's stick with it for uh, emphasis, for making a story here. What's frustrating you at this point is I'm not giving you a percentage. I'm not giving you a number. Like you might want to imagine that this is you know, 0.62. And that's theoretically right. It could be equal to 0.62, but I haven't like supplied a number like that. I think that's what you're looking for. Yeah, but that's okay. I'll hang. I'll, I'll try to keep with the symbolic. Typically, it's, it's easier, easier to build on symbolic uh, understanding, right? I think it takes longer, but once you do, I think you have a richer understanding. That's what I've been forcing you all into. You guys haven't had much of a choice on that. I've kind of demanded it. Yeah, for better or worse. Other questions before we move on? Okay, here we go. So we are looking at, you might say, a new expectation, but more formally, you'd say a new function g. And this one, like the mean, I mean, like probability, has a name. So we're going to pick a new function g, and it's going to give us like a new calculation that we get from expectation. This one has been named mean. Now I'm going to wait until after spring break to try to attach 
um, our current understanding of me mean to what you all might think you have as an understanding of mean, which is add up all the numbers and divide by however many there are. I'm gonna wait a little bit to attach the meaning we'll see today to that. So for now, what we're gonna do is specifically let G be the function that just returns its argument. Now in some circles, they call this the identity function, which I'm just gonna abbreviate ID. What I mean to say, identity. And it's called the identity function because it is the function that just returns its arguments. If you put in the number 7.2, you would get out the number 7.2. If you put in the number negative five, you would get out the number negative five. The identity function just returns its argument. And this is the function we use to get the mean our choice G is equal to the identity function. So it looks like this, you'd have the expectation which operates on a function, specifically in this case, the identity function. And here we go, I'll cram them into one function. If you're working with a discrete distribution, then the identity function is that arbitrary function G times the density. And then you take a sum of that product. Alternatively, if you have a continuous distribution, then you just take the integral of that product. So again, the same stuff shows up inside the integral as inside the sum. The only difference is how you deal with the size of the sample space, the size of the set, the distribution is defined now. How would we write this in R? Oh, the piecewise function? Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, um, hang on, there's a Piazza post on it. Whoops, I just need to figure out where I'm at. Yeah, you'd have to go through and use this piecewise in LaTeX code. Forget who put it up. Jonathan's typing out an example in the chat as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, at this point, Josiah is saying, give me numbers, enough of these letters. So here we go, our first example. Let's take the discrete uniform. And we'll do it with numbers. So we have a density function that depends on A and B. I'm going to let you all pick A and B. If I just chose a fair die, I think you'd be like, enough with the fair die, I'm bored. So I'm letting you all pick. First one to chime in gets to choose. The only requirement is A is less than B. A equal to one, B equal to two. Perfect. Okay, somebody else, Jacob, thank you. But somebody else, who remembers the density function for this one? This is for the discrete uniform. And I gave you a hint. It's a fraction, all you gotta do is put in the number in the bottom. We do have a B minus A, but there's also something else in it. And that's what separates it from the discrete, from the continuous distribution. And once we evaluate it, it will be equal to two. 
the piece in the denominator. Nice. Way to go, group effort. So in this case, we have 2 minus 1 plus 1, which is indeed 1 over 2. So essentially what we have here is a distribution that looks like this. We all okay with that? Okay. So to find the mean, you would take the expectation of the identity function with respect to this density. And so you take the sum for all x's in the sample space. Our sample space just happens to be equal to the set consisting of 1 and 2. You have the identity function of x times the density function of x. I'm just going to do it out so you see exactly where each piece goes. OK, so now I'm just going to replace piece by piece f of x we just decided is equal to 1 half. And that's for all values x. Now look what I did. I took the density function named f and I plugged in whatever its expression is. Now the identity function is just the expression x. So I'm just going to put an x there. Now what about this 1 half? Does it depend on x at all? Or can I do something with it? Take it out. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. So this is not a terribly difficult example here. All we've got to do is add up x equal to 1 plus x equal to 2. I'll do that for us. And I'm just going to put it over in the numerator of this fraction. So this is our answer. This is the mean of the discrete uniform distribution with, this is specific, to a equal to 1 and b equal to 2. Now look, on this plot, this shows up right here. And I'm drawing this as a triangle because the way I want you to think about the mean is as the point along the x-axis that balances the function. The way I want you to think about the mean is the point along the x-axis that balances the density function. So in this case, we have a flat density function. The mean essentially moves along the x-axis until this function is well balanced. And it turns out, because the function is just those two points of equal density, that the function is balanced by the point right in the middle. The mean is just the point along the x-axis that like balances the density function. But our density function just consists of two points with equal weights. They have equal density. So the point that balances this function is right in the middle of those two points. So is it wrong of me to want a more complicated example now? No, but the next one's going to be with letters. <laughs> <laughs> Josiah, these examples are easy to come up with, though. All you have to do is change A and B. Yeah, and that's so I was thinking about that because, you know, where we started and where we got to. But since it is a formula of uh, one over 
uh, b minus a plus one, if it was large numbers, then the balance point would be closer to the larger number. Okay, so I, I feel um, like it'd be fun to go through some on my own and try to kind of explore it. Great. I encourage you to do so. And I encourage you to think about what uniform means as you go through with these. Do you mean uniform as far as density? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this example, at least in my mind, that's what this next example is going to help you see is what the word uniform is supposed to mean here. Okay, so we're going to do a discrete uniform distribution, this time with letters. So we're just going to leave the density function as is and we'll find the mean. So it's the expectation of the identity function. And I'm just gonna fill in some of the pieces right off the bat. So the identity function evaluates to X and the um, density function evaluates to this fraction. So we'll do the same trick that Gary talked about last time take out the fraction because it doesn't depend on x at all. So you can take this fraction outside the sum. I'm going to write out the sample space. Slightly different. It's just the integers from a to b. And we're just going to add up x. Now I'm going to argue that you all have seen a sum like this before. I'm going to argue you all have seen a sum like this in Calc 2 before. Let me rewrite it and see if it makes a little bit more sense. Does this representation ring a bell for anyone? Adding up all the integers from 1 to n. There's a formula for this. What's that formula? You gotta like go in the depths of Calc 2 knowledge. I don't think the formula will come back to me. <laughs> okay, so we're down to 18. <laughs> <laughs> The formula coming back to anybody? This is like three years ago for me, so I'm still trying Aha! to think. Gary's got it with a minute left. I know for some of us, it was way long time ago, right? Okay. Y'all were like 30 seconds ahead of the other section. So big ups to you all. For the other section, they didn't give me an answer in time. I timed them just the same as I timed you. They didn't give me an answer, so I left it as a challenge problem to them. But because you guys gave me a correct answer within two minutes, I'll go through and help you see how this works out. So this is a sum not, not necessarily starting at one. This is a sum starting at A. So we're gonna have to use this cleverly. And here's how I like you to think about it. Imagine a number line where we're starting at A and we're going all the way up to B. What we wanna find is the sum from A up to B for all of these points. These are supposed to be equally spaced integers. So there, it looks more equally spaced now. So we could certainly find the sum up to B. Somewhere down here is zero. So we could certainly find the sum up to B using this formula. So let's just give that a go. The sum up to B is just gonna be B, B plus one over two. But notice what that does. That includes all of these points that we do not want. So how could we get rid of those points? And this is your hint, use this formula again, but be clever. How can we get rid of all those points? What is the point just before A here? 
a minus one. Aha, uh -huh. so how could you apply this formula to add up from one to a minus one? What if you just replaced this with a minus one? What would go would here? You, would we still want to, well, that would be a minus one. And then inside would only be a after canceling. Mm -hmm. But would you still divide by two? Mm -hmm. So when we took that for B, I thought it was some sort of, I mean, it was starting to feel like the mean that we just did. And it will, it will just keep okay. with it. Just keep okay. with it. Okay. We've got a minus one, a over two. Are we doing okay so far? Do we all agree with the simplification I just did? Oh, I'm running out of room though. All right, let's copy it onto a new slide. We've got one over B minus A plus one. All right, somebody's gonna have to Isn't it plus A? This one? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to go back to double check my negatives. So I am sure you are right, Jacob. But if you don't mind, if you won't take insult, I'm going to just double check. You are right. So this negative shows up here. And then negative and negative turns into a plus, just like Jacob said. Okay, let's rearrange because this isn't looking helpful yet. B squared minus A squared plus A minus B. Are those negatives right? Yes. Same story. Don't take offense. I'm just going to double check. I think it should be a plus B, shouldn't it? One more time, let's just double check. Yes, it should be. B squared plus B. So I'm just keeping that B squared plus B going through the next one. Okay, how about this term, B squared minus A squared? It's a difference of squares, right? B plus A times B minus A. Nice. All of our calc rules are coming back. Y'all are going to have to admit it. You just love calculus. This is a lot more like algebra though right now. Well, I'll take that. But one could argue that algebra is just as important in calculus, so if not more. <laughs> All right, I grouped my terms to help you see this next move. I grouped my terms to help you see this next one. Because the next one's tricky. 
Do you all agree B plus A is the same thing as A plus B? Yeah. Okay. I don't know which way is gonna help you see it best. So I'm gonna write it out two ways. We're gonna go one over B minus A plus one. And I'm gonna take this term B plus A out of both sides of the plus. Here's the right side of this plus, And here's the left side. I'm gonna factor an A plus B out. Okay, this one is tricky. I know this is tricky. So I'm trying to write it out the first way. Here's an A plus B and here's an A plus B. I'm gonna factor it out. So I'm pulling it outside of this term. So here's the B minus A and here's that same plus. It might help if you see it with parentheses here. And now you can just distribute the A plus B to each term. It might help if you just rewrite this term as C. So then you can just go C times B minus A, C times B minus A, and distribute the C through, and the C times one. I don't know which way is easier to see, but I've just rewritten the same thing twice because some people like to think of this A plus B differently. Okay, I'm trying to highlight two things with this one example. One, this is why we're not doing many more of these by hand. This was the easiest one you can think of. Two, look at the answer. This is what, dis this is what uniform is giving us. The answer is just add up the endpoints and divide by two. So find the point in the middle. So if we go back to our plot here, the answer is just add up the endpoints and divide by two. That's exactly what we did. One plus two is three divided by two is three halves. It doesn't matter how many points there are here. A can be whatever and B can be whatever. To find the mean, because all the points have equal weight, they're all on a line, all you've got to do is add up the end points and divide by two. And that will give you the point in the middle that balances the density function. So there's two points we took away from this. One, means are hard to do by hand. Two, uniform is telling us that all the densities, the density at each of the points in the uh, sample space is the same. The density is the same for all those points. So in order to find the number in the middle that balances the density function, which is called the mean. All you got to do is take the two endpoints, add them up, and divide by two. And you get the mean. It's the point that balances the density function on the x axis. Maybe another really good takeaway is look, the mean does not have to be a value in the sample space. Three and a half is not one or two. The mean 
does not have to be a point in the sample space. That's really hard for people to see when you think of a die. The mean of a fair die is three and a half, even though there is no face with value three and a half. Okay, we're moving on because I'm running out of time. Next example. The density function for a Bernoulli distribution with P equal to one half looks like this. So to find the mean, which is just the expectation of the identity function, you'll just plug in the identity function, which evaluates to X for all values X in the sample space times the density function This one looks tough at first because of all of these exponents, but really X can only take on two values. And one of these values in particular is gonna simplify everything. So the first value X can take on is zero. You go zero times the density function at zero. So there's the density function at x equal to zero. Now the density function for x equals to one just looks like this. All I've done is plugged in x equals zero everywhere for the first term. And for the second term, I just plugged in x equals to one. Zero times that anything is zero. And this next one evaluates really easily too. One times, okay, so it's whatever. 0.5 to the one is just 0.5. And this is really just 0.5 to the zero, which is? One. Good, one. So this whole thing just evaluates to 0.5. But look, then this is essentially just the same picture as we saw before. Just shifted down to zero and one instead of three and a half. All right, I'll, I'm gonna leave you with two challenge problems because according to the clock that I'm following for timing the class, I only have one minute left. So I'm gonna leave you with two challenge problems, one of which is easy and one of which is hard. So both classes got challenge problems, more than one. Assume you've got a Bernoulli with probability P and you don't specify what number it is. You just say it's P. Find the mean. The density function looks like this. And this one follows along very similarly to what we just did on the last slide. So this one isn't too bad. You should be able to check your answer for this one just by plugging in one half into your answer and ensuring you get out whatever we got for the last one. Here comes the tougher one. I have
haven't really introduced you to the exponential distribution yet. It has density function that depends on a value we call lambda. And the sample space is the set, the uncountable set from zero to infinity. So this is a continuous distribution. I want you to find the mean and I'll give you the answer. So you have a way to check. Okay, all since this was recorded and you can come back to these last 30 seconds uh, super easily on your own time, I'm going to leave you with my hint and then I'm going to stop recording. I almost forgot the hint. It's a terrible hint. And at that point, I'll stop recording. If you need to get out of here, I thank you for your last minute of time. <laughs>